Welcome to the Cambridge Drive Community Church's online worship for the third Sunday of Easter, April 26, 2020. Our format will include two scripture readings, a prayer, a sermon, and a benediction. In the description below, there are links for five songs on YouTube. We typically use five songs in our physical worship services at Cambridge Drive Church in Goleta, California. We've chosen them to support the theme of today's service. I would recommend that you watch the first three now at the beginning of this service, the fourth one just before the sermon, and the final one after the sermon and before the benediction. Let us join together now in worship. Our first scripture reading today is from Psalm 116, verses 1 to 4, and then 12 to 19. I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications, because he has inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, save my life. What shall I return to the Lord for all his bounty to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful ones. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the child of your serving girl. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you a thanksgiving sacrifice and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. Our God, we find you in the big things, both beautiful and terrible. We expect to find you in matters of life and death, disaster and rebirth, closed and empty graves. Remind us today of the reality that you are there in the quiet in between as well. And that if we but open our eyes, we can see you more clearly in the everyday of life. A Tuesday meal prepared with love and commitment. A telephone call just to say hello. A cup of tea or coffee sitting together at table. A walk in the neighborhood surrounded by the sights and sounds of life. It is in the time of big things that we find ourselves, of anxiety and fear, of hope and dreams, of heroism and of stupidity. And in the midst of all of this, let us find rest in you, peace in you, beauty in you, that all of our days might be redeemed and made whole. We do give thanks for those whose work is essential, who keep us fed, who keep us well, who keep us safe. Bless them that their gifts to the rest of us may be multiplied back to them, and they will know the grace they share deep in their souls. Hear the prayers we speak and the prayers we hold in our hearts for we bring them all in the gentle name of Jesus. Amen. Here our second reading of scripture today from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. Also from the New Revised Standard Version. Now, on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. 
but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. He said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. We had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and beside all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were there with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are! How slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared! Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. And then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. I have a friend who tells me that she had an experience where she saw Jesus. I have to be honest and say the logical side of me immediately discounts her story. Indeed, as does my own experience, I've never physically seen Jesus. Metaphorically, yeah, I think so. I'd argue yes, but not literally, physically. And whenever this friend tells me that she has seen Jesus, I tend to wonder whether she is talking in metaphors, even though I know she would say she's not, that she literally, physically saw Jesus. And then, of course, as I think about that, the next question is, would I recognize Jesus even if I did see him? It is a real question. There were two disciples in today's scripture on the road to Emmaus, and they had walked with Jesus for some time. They had seen the blind receive their sight. They had watched as the lame picked up their pallets and walked They watched as Jesus turned social structures upside down and treated women as whole people. They'd heard stories that painted even Samaritans as true neighbors and presented a new ethic for dealing with other people. They'd even watched as 
Jesus called Lazarus out of the grave and gave him back to his sisters, alive. They were there when a crowd of over 5,000 was fed with just a few small loaves of bread and some small fish. They heard teachings about a new kingdom based on an entirely new set of rules, defined by shalom for all people, where the divisions of class and nationality and the barriers of birth no longer existed. Again and again, Jesus had destroyed their understanding of reality and shocked them with new visions and new dreams. Through him, they had encountered the presence of God in ways they had never imagined prior. Through him, they had seen God in action, and they knew the wonders that God could do. They'd given up everything to follow Jesus. And for at least the last months, almost every moment of their lives had been intertwined with his life. They traveled, they ate, they slept, they cried, they rejoiced with Jesus. They planned their future and evaluated their pasts in the light of this man. It would be difficult to imagine the lives of people being tethered together in a more intimate fashion than theirs had been with Jesus. Yet, when they met him here on the road to Emmaus, they didn't recognize him. They'd heard the word that he was raised from the dead, but their understanding of reality told them such things didn't, couldn't happen. Jesus was dead and buried, and everything was suddenly headed in both an undesirable but understandable new direction. They had known every curve of his face, every mannerism in his walk, and yet they did not see Jesus walking on the road next to them. They'd heard Jesus' unique understanding of the scriptures, portraying this new kingdom of God coming for all people, yet they didn't think it was unusual to hear this same understanding coming from someone else. They'd heard his voice enough to have each inflection burned into their memories, yet as he spoke, it never occurred to them that this was Jesus sharing the journey to Emmaus. They had a picture of reality that said there are some things that even God cannot do. Jesus walking next to them three days after he was crucified and buried was one of them, in spite of the report they had already gotten that he was risen. And then something unusual happens. Something wonderful happens. The disciples recognize Jesus as they sit down to share a meal. The way the sentence is phrased, it hints at communion, perhaps, but my gut tells me that hint comes more from Luke than from the event itself. Jesus sat down to eat and broke the bread. That is how... You divided bread in those days. You didn't cut it with a serrated knife. And it was there in that common everyday experience of food shared, not in the walking or talking or even teaching of Jesus, that they recognized him. No, they knew him in the everyday experience of eating together at table. And as he he is recognized, he disappears. And then they look back and find reasons to see that it had been Jesus all along on the road. They see Jesus walking with them, teaching them, talking to them in hindsight. It is the everyday sharing of a meal that allows this all to take place. 
As a preacher, I have to say, it's a hard lesson for me. A well-crafted sermon is important to me. I pride myself on the effort that I put into providing just that. I work hard during normal times to put together a worship service that hangs together, that communicates clearly the message I believe God has for us that week. Yet, here we see the two disciples, and they don't see Jesus even when he is the one expounding the scriptures to them as they walk down the road. Please, don't get me wrong. That hard work, that good work of putting together a a sermon that helps us to understand the scriptures, it is important. But this passage tells me that Jesus isn't always seen there except in hindsight. Something else comes first. It is in the everyday sharing of life that he is most clearly seen. I've been feeling that keenly of late. Life is constricted as we shelter in place. Now, I I know that we experience this contagion very differently depending on, on what's going on in our lives. Some of us are devastated by the virus. Some of us are devastated by the economic mess that it has caused. Others, less so. But for all of us, unless we are experiencing the very worst of this storm, it makes us see the everyday more clearly. Small examples of caring. Realizing that we hear birds singing, that we see flowers that we haven't noticed before as we take time to walk through our neighborhood. In those everyday experiences, I see the presence of God. There's a joke that goes around religious groups that underscores this truth of the importance of the everyday. A teacher once asked her third graders to each bring something to their class that represented their religious background. She wanted the children to understand their diversity. And so a Roman Catholic child brought a crucifix. A Jewish child brought a menorah. A Sikh boy brought his kata, the bracelet that reminds him of his unbreakable connection with God and reminds him always to protect the vulnerable. The Baptist girl, she brought a covered dish. Here's the bit, though. Whenever I tell that joke in mixed religious groups, every single group disagrees with the punchline. In every single group, they tell that same joke with them being the ones who bring the food. When a Jewish person tells the joke, it is the Jewish child who brings the food. When a Methodist tells that joke, it is the Methodist. Even the Episcopalians bring the food. And they all protest to me that I got the joke wrong. For all of them, their faith is most deeply experienced in the simple everyday act of eating together. My seminary preaching professor said that every sermon must include a call to action or it's not a sermon. It's just a a, a good teaching or a good exposition of the scripture. For today's passage, that call is simple. Live. Do the every day as an expression of faith and in doing those everyday things, preparing and eating food, cleaning the house, sitting in the still moment and hearing the birds sing. In all of those experiences, find the very presence of Jesus. Then if you want, 
You can go back and talk about what it all means. You can talk theology. You can expound scriptures. But most importantly, this time on the road to Emmaus is only understood when looked at through the lens of the everyday. And we can find Jesus in the everyday if we but open our eyes. Hear these words of benediction. Let us walk. Let us eat. Let us work. Let us just be the very stuff of life. For it is there that we will experience the presence of the risen Lord Jesus. It is there that we most deeply learn that we are blessed and God is with us. Amen. Mm -hmm.